Hi, I'm Tom Phillips and this is the BuzzFeed and Facebook EU Referendum Town Hall Live. Four leading politicians, one live studio audience here at Facebook's frankly very fancy London headquarters. Now, up in just a few minutes at 3pm, we've got Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, who'll be facing the questions in our arena about why she thinks we should stay in the EU. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about Nicola Sturgeon in just a moment, but previously in the first Q&A, we had Armed Forces Minister and Leave campaigner Penny Mordaunt. Uh, now, she spoke quite a lot about defence issues in that. Uh, let's take a look at one of the key moments from that Q&A. The problem with the EU is that you can never really trust it. Um, it says, no, 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 we're not going to do that. But, you know, a few years on, it's exactly what we're doing. And this is our opportunity to say, no, we want to cooperate with Europe. We want to help with all of these things. But we want to do it on our own terms. So there's no, there's no guarantee. And as there's only two full-spectrum defence capability nations in the EU. We're one of them. So, now, Alberto Nardelli, BuzzFeed UK's Europe editor, is with me. Now, uh, so, Penny Mordaunt says that you can't trust the EU, and she said that in relation to an EU army. So, if we stay in the EU, EU are we going to have an EU army anytime soon? I think that's highly unlikely. I mean, if you think about it, the EU as an organisation has been debating for months now what to do about weed killers. It will be very difficult for such an organisation to put together an army. But jokes aside, the, 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 the rationale here is very similar to the Turkey joining the EU argument. The reality is that if there is not agreement between all EU member states on these issues, then these things do not happen. And Mordaunt repeated the point around the veto. And as we said earlier, this is incorrect. All EU member states have the ability to veto new memberships. Yeah, she said, because she was asked about Turkey, uh, where she said that we won't be able to veto it. Uh, and David Cameron, in fact, who we'll be hearing from later, has specifically said that she's completely wrong on that front. Is that correct? Like, she kept on defending that claim. What's actually true there? Well, I think that there are two issues here. So, so one, on the one hand, the David Cameron and the UK in general, and Boris Johnson for that matter, have been supportive of Turkish membership. But that could mean that Penny Morden doesn't trust whoever is in government in the UK in whatever moment Turkey's membership is discussed. But the reality is that there are many other countries around Europe who have been and continue to be opposed to Turkey joining the EU. And unless there is unanimity, all those countries agree Turkey will not be joining the EU anytime soon. OK. So that's interesting. Um, one thing, there's a bit of chat about the 350 million uh, per week issue, how much we spend. What's the actual figure there? <laughs> Well, Does anybody know? What, what I thought was really interesting about that is that it showed the effectiveness of the Leave campaign because everyone remembers that number, which is misleading, but no one remembered yeah. the actual figures. And, so I've got to stop you there. So we've been through Penny Mordaunt and we're now going to have a look at the person who's coming up next, someone who definitely wants us to stay in, and that's Nicola Sturgeon. So here's a little bit about her. Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister of Scotland. Thrilling stuff. Okay, before we hear from her in the arena, though, let's check back in with the lovely Alberto to learn some more non-boring things about the EU. Okay, Alberto, so you've mentioned sovereignty earlier in our last broadcast as another key issue, not as important as the economy, for instance, but um, what, uh, why does Nicola Sturgeon want to leave the UK but also be in the, in the um, EU? Well, I guess in an ideal world, Sturgeon would want an independent Scotland as part of the EU, but she has been very clear on this issue. She doesn't believe that leaving the EU is a price worth paying for independence. I think in this debate, the issue of sovereignty can really be boiled down to two positions. The Leave side believes that uh, it needs to leave, that Britain needs to leave the EU to take back control of its borders, its courts, and um, its laws, while the Remain side believes that giving away a little bit of sovereignty to be part of the single market is a price worth paying. Um, so the single market, can you explain what that is and also why we can't have access to the single market um, but also more control over our borders, for instance? Well, the key thing to keep in mind here is that the single market was developed around four pillars. The freedom of, uh, to, to move goods, the freedom to move services, 
freedom of movement for people and freedom of movement for capital. These are the four key principles that will not change. So there is no scenario or no arrangements between countries and the European Union where a country has full access to that single market and full control of uh, immigration and doesn't have to accept freedom of movement. So if you want to be able to move capital around, you also have to be able to move people around because people are part of the, cap they're part of the <laughs> capitalist system, aren't they, Alberto? Absolutely. They're part of the market. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, is, is the idea then that um, countries, if we got a really good deal at the last minute, if the EU said, no, no, stay, you can have everything you want, then everybody else would want that also. Is that I the think, idea? I, I think it's, it's a bit like membership of a club. So if you imagine the, uh, the single market as a club, uh, there is a fee that you have to pay to be a part of that club. There are some rules that you have to have to be, you know, to enjoy the benefits uh, of the club. If, the, if, you ha if you start having countries that start, you can have a discount here, you don't have to accept these rules here, and you can cherry pick uh, what you do within that club to just have the benefits, then eventually that club will You'd be a jerk out. if you got that, basically. Nobody in the club would like you, nobody would lunch with you. But anyway, um, if we left the EU, would we need a visa to go on holiday? And importantly, would we get stamps in our passports again? That's highly unlikely. Okay. I think there's a big distinction to be made like between going on holiday somewhere, and that will not change. If Britain leaves the EU, we will not need a, a visa to go on holiday anywhere in Europe. In the same way, we don't need a visa to go on holiday in many countries outside of True. Europe. The big difference will be, be having the ability to work in other countries. Right now, you can work pretty much anywhere in the EU without a work permit. That is the fundamental thing that will change. Um, but Alberto, as a suave Italian, you're not going to be deported suddenly if we leave the EU, right? I'm sorry for you, I'm not. Oh, okay. Well, maybe if they knew more about you, you would get deported. But anyway, um, thank you very much. I've learned loads. Excited to hear more from Nicola. You're blowing my mind. Thank you, guys, and uh, we're just a few seconds now away from our next town hall with First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, facing our live audience's questions. Now, remember, if you're watching this online, you can join in too. We want your comments. We want your questions for Nicola Sturgeon. Just put them in the comments. We're reading them all, and we'll be putting the best of those to Nicola. Now, let's go over to our arena where we're joining BuzzFeed UK's Emily Ashton and politics editor Jim Waterson. Welcome to the arena. I'm Emily Ashton. And I'm Jim Watson. And we're joined by an audience of BuzzFeed readers who have all come bursting with questions for the second of our live EU referendum town halls. In a moment, we'll be joined by Nicola Sturgeon, who is backing the Remain campaign. Now, while you're watching, let us know whether you agree or not with what she has to say. Show us how you feel by using the love or the angry reactions on Facebook. And keep an eye out for our reaction tracker at the bottom of the screen during the show. Tell us what you'd like to ask her by posting your questions here on BuzzFeed's Facebook page as a comment, and our own Remy Patel will select some to ask Nicola Sturgeon during the next 40 minutes. So now, to make the case for remaining in the EU, will you please welcome the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. Hi there. As you probably know, I am all for countries being independent. So you might be wondering, why do I believe that the UK and Scotland should remain part of the EU? The answer is quite simple. We live in a globalised world. People work and study and live and interact across borders. And therefore, independent countries have to work together. And that's really what the EU is all about. Independent countries not giving up their independence, but choosing to work together for the benefit of all of us, cooperating on issues like peace and security, increasing trade and creating jobs, but also ensuring that workers' rights are protected right across the continent, and cooperating to deal with big global issues that no one country can deal with alone, like climate change, for example. I think working together in that way is a good thing. The Leave campaign say it's about giving up control. I don't think that that's the case. If you go to countries like France and Germany, uh, they don't think they've given up control or given up their independence. So independence is good for any country, but working together in an interdependent world 
is also good. So on June the 23rd, I hope we choose to stay part of building a better Europe and a better world, not just for this generation, but for generations to come as well. Thank you very much, First Minister. We've got our first question. It's from Amy Burke. Where's Amy? Here we are. What's your question for the First Minister? With all the scaremongering and the political power play that's been going on from both sides, do you think that the people of the UK you know, have enough information to make an informed decision on the 23rd of June? Um, I think there's a lot of information out there if, if you know where to find it. I, I think people understandably are looking for certainty about what happens if you vote this way or you vote that way. In truth, and we found this during the Scottish referendum, in truth there are no certainties or guarantees about what happens in the future. You've got to apply your common sense um, and make a decision about what you think is the right thing to do. What will be better for jobs and the economy? What will be better for securing peace across Europe? What will be better for our students? Uh, is it better for them to have the ability to go and study in other countries, just as we welcome people here? So the information is there, um, and there's a lot of it. But ultimately, each and every one of us, and we all just have that one vote in two weeks' time, we've got to do what we think in our heart and in our head is the right thing. And in both my heart and in my head, I think it's the right thing to remain part of the European Union. First Minister, are you happy with the negative Project Fear campaign being fought by the Remain campaign in this? I don't like negative campaigning. You know, I campaigned in the Scottish referendum and I was on the receiving end uh, of that kind of scaremongering for, what, two or, or three years. I don't like it. I don't think it treats people uh, with respect. And ultimately, I don't think it's very effective. To be fair, though, I, I think the Leave campaign has probably... Uh, had uh, more of the, the negativity and, and downright dishonesty, I think, in their campaign than has been the case for the Remain campaign. But I've been calling for and I've been trying my best to put forward the positive case for staying in Europe. I don't think the European Union is perfect. I think there's lots I'd like to see change about it. But I think we're better off in trying to change from within rather than being out. Because the danger of being out is you end up having to uh, abide by and be affected by all the rules and regulations anyway to keep trading but you just don't have the control and the ability to influence those rules and regulations. Just checking with the crowd here, I mean, how many people feel that they're well informed during this debate and they've got all the facts that they need? Is there anyone at all? Oh, there's a few people. You've, you've, well, I'm glad that you really feel like you're on top of this. There's, there's a few people in this room. But broadly speaking, what, what do you make? What, okay, thanks very much, sir. Good, good plan. Um, what do you make of that? I think it's um, part of it's a trust issue. Is everyone saying the other, parties, the other side's lying? And how, you know, how can we, tr who do we trust? Which side do we choose? And I think that's, that's the part that's, that's you know, struggling. I, I don't want to keep uh, harking back to the, the independence referendum in Scotland because the, the two are not the same. But what happened there was that as the closer we got to polling day, the less people listened to politicians or the media and the more people got their views, actually from social media quite a lot, uh, but also from their workmates or their family members or, or people uh, that they knew in other capacities. And, and there was a really fantastic debate amongst people across the country. And, and I hope over the, it's only two weeks to go now, but I hope that's the kind of enthusiasm uh, and engaged debate that we see in the remainder of this campaign too. Emily, what have you got for us over there? Yep, next question over here. I think it's James. What's your Hi, question James. for Nicholas Sturgeon? Right, um, having come to see some of your more strident nationalist supporters uh, be become effectively whinging gnats during the Scottish referendum, um, many southerners would be quite happy to say goodbye to Scotland. But what would you say to people like me who see this referendum as an opportunity to kill two birds with one stone? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I hope to persuade you that whatever happens with Scotland in, in the future, whether Scotland becomes independent, as I hope it will or not, then Scotland will always be a very uh, good friend and neighbour to people in the rest of the UK. My grandmother was English, uh, lived in Scotland most of her life, so was quite a big Scottish nationalist, but I, I believe in the family of nations. I just think we should all be independent nations and cooperating on that basis, and I guess that's what the European Union is about as well. Uh, what I would say to you in terms of this debate is, you know, even if that's your view about Scotland, and I would hope to, to try to change your mind, if not today, then over the, the longer term. Don't cut, off your nose, <laughs> don't cut off your nose to spite your face. Don't take a decision about the future of the UK based on a, a grievance or a, 
uh, a gripe that you might have about Scotland or the SNP or me or, or anybody else. Do what you think in your heart is the right thing for the UK. And I honestly <laughs> believe, and you know, I'm, I'm a Scottish nationalist, I'm not going to try to hide that, but I do care what happens in the rest of the UK because it affects Scotland. And what happens in Scotland affects the rest of the UK. So I, I wouldn't want to see, even if Scotland was independent, I wouldn't want to see the rest of the UK But isn't, vote isn't it true that Europe. your motivation is that Scotland can only qualify to join the EU independently? I thought you were going to say qualify for the being, European being, Championships. That's a poor within. point right now. <laughs> Look, you know, let, let, me, let me come clean here. Spain will, you know, Spain will veto an independent Scotland joining the EU, won't it? Well, You'll have, have the Catalans. I, do you know what? I, I, I was never convinced that was the case. I'm, I'm less convinced of, of that now. The European Union, since the, the day it was established, has, has grown. That's one of the gripes some people have about it. But I, I've n I was never convinced, and I, I'm still uh, absolutely not convinced, that if Scotland through its own democratic decision-making, opted for self-determination that Europe would somehow decide to throw out. One of the ironies, of course, is that some of the people now who are campaigning passionately for Brexit were also people who, uh, in the Scottish referendum, said you've got to vote against independence to protect your membership of the European Union because if you vote for independence, you'll get thrown out. So there's a bit of an irony now, now hearing uh, these arguments in, in reverse. What I was going to say, of course, is we've got an added uh, an added motivation in Scotland. You know, it's the closest we're going to get to European influence over the next few weeks uh, staying in the European Union because we're not going to have it in football, uh, unlike the other nations of the, the UK. OK, moving on. Next question. So, uh, we've got Jessica. Where's Jessica? Here we are. So, Jessica, what question have you got for the First Minister? I want to know why, if you're willing to fight for independence and sovereignty for Scotland so hard, are you willing to give it up for the UK and let us become a, well, let us be in this EU super state? I think that's a fair question for me, and I appreciate that's something that people often think uh, when they listen to me is, you know, a bit odd. Why do I support independence for Scotland but want Scotland and the UK to stay in the European Union? Um, effectively, the answer to that is Scotland and the UK is not the same as the UK in Europe. The European Union is an organisation made up of independent member states. I would like Scotland to be one of those independent <coughs> member states. I would love the Scottish First Minister to have much influence on the decisions the UK government takes, as David Cameron or any Prime Minister has on the decisions that the European Union takes. So the, the two are very different things. And I guess the evidence of that is that some of the, the key campaigners for the Leave campaign were passionately opposed to Scottish independence. So the, the arguments are very different. Whether Scotland is independent, as I hope it will be one day in the future, uh, or part of the UK, uh, we should be, in my view, in the European Union because it's better for trade and the economy and the cultural and social links uh, that, that have been forged between countries that have been one of the things that have helped keep the peace for our lifetimes. We, we take it for granted now that, you know, before uh, the European Union was established for much of the last, what, thousand years, countries in Europe were at war with each other. We've had the longest uninterrupted period of peace in modern history, and that's something I should, actually I think we should be prepared to hold on to and value and cherish. So, Remy, what are people saying on Facebook about First Minister so far? Uh, we've actually got uh, Ben Crowden here who says, um, are you prepared to use a euro for currency in a post-Brexit independent Scotland? Uh, no, I've, the, the, the pound is Scotland's currency just as it is England's currency. That's the, the currency I think all parts of the UK should use, and it's the one so I would we, want so to So even if to uh, we vote to leave the EU? The, the, I, I, I'm not really here to kind of start to talk about hypothetical upon hypothetical. I'm, I'm here to try to persuade you to vote Remain and to do that wherever you live in the UK. But Scotland uses the pound. It's our currency, just as it is your currency or anybody across the UK, and that's the currency I think we should continue to use. We've got another question here from Will Hingley. He says, we are voting as the UK in this referendum. Why do you think it's okay to have your own project fear by saying we may have a second independence referendum? I, I'm not here, as I say, to, to talk about what might happen in the scenario of, of an outvote. I've, I've said, and I've just said this quite straightforwardly, in the Scottish referendum, the U membership of the European Union was actually one of the big issues in that campaign. And interestingly, both sides said our membership of Europe was important. Um, and the No campaign said, you've got to vote no to protect our European Union membership. So if a couple of years later we find ourselves, and we don't know what will happen in two weeks' time, but if Scotland voted to stay in but found ourselves taken out in the strength of a UK-wide vote, I, I'm simply stating the obvious, that I think many people in Scotland would think that was a bit unfair. 
given what happened and what was debated in the referendum. But I don't want that to happen. I, of course I want Scotland to be independent, but I don't want to become independent because the UK leaves the European Union. So I hope that people in Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland vote to remain in the EU because I think it is in the best interest of all of us. Is that, sorry, sorry, we're just getting... Is there anyone else in the crowd who wants to have a word about how the hypocrisy, <laughs> or any hypocrisy in this? Lauren, what do you think of that one? Oh, I don't want to talk about what happens when we leave, but you want to convince us to stay not talking about what's going to happen when we leave. It seems a bit no, contradictory. I, I'm simply, I hope we don't leave. That's the point. It, look, if, if there's a vote for Brexit in just under two weeks' time, there'll be all sorts of consequences. Um, and, you know, they'll go way beyond what happens with Scotland and the UK. And we'll all have to deal with those consequences. But we're two weeks away from polling day. And I think it's reasonable that I say to you, I'm trying to persuade enough people to vote Remain so that we're not dealing with those consequences. And, and that's why I'm trying to make the positive case to stay in. I mean, for me, I'm undecided and I need to know what those consequences are if I did vote to leave. And I don't, I'm not really hearing well, what they I've, are. I've said, and I'm trying to say it honestly and frankly, I think in Scotland, if there was a vote to leave, and obviously that would assume Scotland had voted to stay in, I think many, many people in Scotland, not everybody, but many people in Scotland would say, we want to look again at independence because that would be the way to protect our membership of the European Union. So I'm, I'm being frank about that. But I'm also saying I hope that doesn't happen because I hope the whole of the UK votes to remain. And I hope uh, once you've made up your mind, you make up your mind to vote to remain too. And we've got a question over here, Hi. William. Um, Sorry, we'll just I, get a mic to you, one second. I, I believe that, um, well I'm English, but I believe that Scotland, if it wishes to become an independent country, should become an independent country. Yet I, I understand that Scotland could do so much more if it was an independent country, but it, I think it lacks, it, I don't think it realises it. I think if you like, you know, instead of trading with the European Union, you can maybe get involved in your Scandinavian Union that you would like to do. Maybe you can do, maybe you could join the Krona as a potential option. <laughs> maybe you can, like... It's not, it's not in our plans. I know, but maybe you can, like, regenerate the, you know, the docks around Glasgow and the Clyde, you know, that are, like, you know, are in a, such a bad state. I think, I think Scotland has the potential outside of the European Union and Britain, if so it wishes to leave. I think, really, Scotland has got good potential, yet I don't think it really um, estimate, uh, understands what it wants to do in a way. I think Scotland, okay. for the time being, should you know, be in the UK, but when it's ready through devolution, which is going to happen, I think Scotland has the right to go, yet I think it can be successful if it leaves the European Union as well. I, th I think that's fair. Yeah. And we're not, yeah. we're not deciding in this referendum whether or not Scotland becomes independent or not. And, and I think Scotland and the UK shouldn't be constrained by Europe. You know, we should see the, the entire world as uh, the stage in which we want to, to operate. Uh, but, you know, if you take Scotland, for example, and, you know, these figures are broadly similar to the figures in the UK, about 40% of our international exports go to European Union countries. And therefore, the single market is really important for jobs and investment in Scotland, and that's one of the key reasons why I think we should well, stay. Wasn't it like 62% of Scottish trade is with the UK as well? Sure, but, so. but Scotland, if Scotland was independent, I, I would want it to stay within the single market. So trade with the rest of the UK would be within the single market, hopefully, if the UK is still in the European Union. But much of our exports, international exports, go to other European okay. Union countries. Okay, let's move on to the next question, and that's from Flora. What's your question? So, given the EU referendum is not legally binding for the government, if there were a, so we voted to leave by a very narrow margin, would you support David Cameron, like, actually leaving, or would you try to encourage him to hold another vote or to try and negotiate with the EU and go against public opinion? If there's a vote to leave, I think he's got to respect that and he's got to hear what, what people uh, say. I, I, I hope that won't happen, and that's uh, what I'm going to be playing my small part in trying to do over the next couple of weeks is persuade people not to go down that road. I was, uh, as you know, taking part in a debate last night that, that Boris Johnson was taking part in for the Leave campaign and uh, I was in preparing for that reading something he'd written just as recently as February this year where he was talking about the fact that if there was a vote to leave the European Union 
there would be years and years and years of trying to negotiate the arrangements that would have to be put in place. And he said that would divert all of our attention from all the things we've got to be focusing on. And, you know, I agree with what he said back then. Um, you know, I, I think that it's not a case, and, you know, it, I argued for Scottish independence, it's not a case of countries not being able to survive if they choose a particular path. It's just, I think, for the UK, staying within the European Union is better. You know, we've got a, across the UK a, a market of 65 million people. In the EU, we've got a market of 500 million people. It's the biggest single market in the whole world. Now, for uh, one of the biggest sectors in the Scottish economy is food and drink. You know, we sell our, our whiskey and our salmon and all the other wonderful things that you can eat and drink in Scotland. We sell those into the European market. It'd be much, much more difficult if there were barriers and tariffs. We'd sell less of it, and our economy and jobs in the economy would be hit as a result. And that's why I think economically it's important to stay in. But but Nicola Sturgeon, can I just say, England is a more Eurosceptic nation than Scotland, polls show. Is there a chance that Scotland could keep England in the EU against its will? Well, you know, these scenarios, all, all of these scenarios, of course, are, are possible. I guess what I'm saying to people is, you know, we, these scenarios, you know, Scotland being taken out against our will or Scotland tipping the balance to keep everybody in, these scenarios don't materialise if there's a strong vote for Remain in every part of the UK. And that's what I'm arguing for. I'm arguing uh, principally in Scotland, as you would expect, but also uh, when I get the chance uh, in other parts of the UK to say, let's all vote to stay in, and then none of these scenarios, and you could you know, hypothecate endlessly about the things that might happen, but none of that arises if we all uh, vote strongly to stay in. Floral. You know, I, Sorry, we'll just I don't actually. Do you know what? I, I, know, I know everybody believes that That's politicians. What I, would feel like if I, I know. You. And I know everybody <laughs> believes, with, with some justification, I should add, that politicians spend all of their time kind of, you know, pushing the pieces around the chessboard and trying to work out, you know, what suits their best interests best. Um, and sometimes we do, I'm not pretending otherwise. But on this, I, I take quite a straightforward view of it. Yes, you know, I want Scotland to be independent, but I don't want Scotland to be come independent because our nearest neighbour and you know, best friend has taken a decision that I actually think would be really damaging for okay, it. Let's give um, Flora a chance to the come back. View I take. Flora, did Just you as a follow-up, so you're saying that you would actively encourage the MPs in your party if Scotland voted with a strong... Sorry. Because there's legislation that needs to be repealed and needs to be repealed by the Westminster Parliament, you would encourage your party to vote to repeal that legislation even if Scotland strongly voted to remain in the EU? Well, we're getting into the realms of, you know, hy hypothetical scenarios here that... It, well, exactly, but I'm, I'm standing here saying... Let's not allow those hypothetical scenarios to arise. Let's vote strongly to stay. Well, you know, I tell you, if, if that's the situation that we end up in, then I'll have all these questions to answer, and I'll give you a commitment to come back and do it live uh, with BuzzFeed and, and Facebook. But I don't think, you know, the, the energy I'm going to expend over these next couple of weeks is not to kind of think through all of these really difficult and really, you know, in my view, pretty negative scenarios that might arise when I can instead spend that energy trying to say to people, look, there's lots of really good reasons to vote to stay in the European Union. Um, and that's what I'm going to try to do. OK, we have another question from Facebook. Yes, we Ready? do. We've got a Nathan Young here. He says, can you tell us how TTIP will benefit us if we stay? And will you be open about its impact on jobs, the NHS, workers' rights and environmental regulation? But actually, could you please explain to everyone here what TTIP is, please, Nicholas Sturgeon? The TTIP is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. So it's the proposed trade treaty between the European Union and the United States of America. Uh, actually, I've got big concerns about uh, TTIP, uh, principally because as it stands, I think it could have an impact on our public services and our national health service. Um, but I think there's quite an easy way to deal with that concern. Uh, because if, if David Cameron and I have urged David Cameron to do this, just said that the UK would not agree to uh, a, a treaty that had those provisions in it, then that would uh, take care of that. So it's not, you know, I, I, so I think it's easy to say that's all Europe's fault. I think the answer to this particular issue lies within the hands of the UK government. And it makes the central point, you know, being in the EU doesn't mean giving up control over these things. You can flex your muscle, you can use your influence, and that's what David Cameron should be doing on TTIP. There's some other issues uh, in TTIP about you know, the potential for companies to sue governments if they change policy in a way that 
uh, the, the companies don't like. I think that's wrong. I don't think that should be there. Now, trade treaties in general terms are good things because they ease trade between countries, but we shouldn't sign up to trade agreements that damage things we hold dear. And I don't think there's anything uh, that we hold dear, and this is true across the UK, that we hold more dear than our National Health Service, and we should not allow it to be compromised in this way. First Minister, so one of the things that we've been picking up, and obviously both in this room and elsewhere, it's a very, very tight race. Why, if you think the case is so overwhelming, are the polls still so close? And do you think that David Cameron has been fighting a good campaign? Um, I, um, I, <laughs> look, I, I'm not going to stand here and start to criticise other politicians. It would be the easiest thing for any politician to do, Go and I'm as, I'm as guilty of that. <laughs> I'm as guilty of that as anybody. And believe me, the temptation to do so is, is really strong at the moment, but I'm, I'm going to resist it. Because I... <laughs> I, yeah, I'm responsible for how I campaign. I'm not responsible for how any, anybody else campaigns. And I'm going to try and campaign as positively as I can. I think David Cameron's right to say that there would be some serious implications for the UK if uh, we vote to come out of the European Union. And he's got a duty to point those out. Um, but I suppose I'm also, because of the experience of the Scottish referendum, I'm living proof that you don't have to believe everything that comes out of the mouth of David Cameron or George Osborne <laughs> to vote positively and enthusiastically to stay in. So do you think that in this, um, in this particular occasion, would you call yourself a unionist in this referendum? I, I wouldn't use that term. I, I, would call myself, I would call myself a Europhile, um, an enthusiastic European. I'm, I'm you know, a proud Scot. I, you know, I've got lots of aspects of British identity. I'm not scared to say that, but I'm also a proud... European, and I don't think, and that's maybe one, one of the reasons, we'll wait and see whether Scotland's more uh, Euro-friendly than uh, the rest of the UK in a couple of weeks' time. I don't take that for granted, incidentally. But maybe one of the things that is different between Scotland and England is we've, for a long time, you know, had these kind of multiple identities that, you know, most of us are quite comfortable with. Um, and I have no difficulty at all in, in saying that, and I'm absolutely a very proud uh, Europhile and somebody who wants us to stay part of trying to improve lives for people across the continent. Is there anyone over here who has any views on in terms of whether Nicola should be sort of sharing a platform with the Conservatives in terms of this battle or sort of trying to do a unified front? No, no, never. What about Jessica? I was just thinking, if you can, I mean, you can share a platform with the Conservatives, obviously, on this, but it just seems, after all the scare tactics they used, a bit hypocritical that you're then helping with these scare tactics during the EU referendum, because it's not... They use this against you, and then for you to be willing to use the same thing to keep us in Europe seems a bit... Whether you decide to stay in Europe is, is your decision. Uh, just Well, it's, it's the decision for all of us to take individually. I hope there's nothing I'm doing that is trying to scare people. I, I don't believe... I don't believe scare tactics work. And, you know, if, if you take the Scottish referendum... Well, people say... And, of course, the No Campaign won. I'm not trying to sort of rewrite history and pretend <laughs> otherwise, much as I wish I could. But yes, the No Campaign won, but the No Campaign started the Scottish referendum campaign with something like a 30-point lead in the polls, and it got to the stage, the narrow uh, state it got to by polling day. So the evidence of the Scottish referendum, notwithstanding the result, is actually scare campaigns lose, the su lose support for the people who are prosecuting those scare campaigns. So I hope I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm desperately trying to put forward a positive uh, case. But ultimately... And this was the case in Scotland. It's a case across the UK. It's this, people say, who's sovereign? Um, actually, we are sovereign. The people are sovereign. The sovereignty of the people is actually an old Scottish constitutional principle. And it's the case here. We've all got one vote on the 23rd of June, so we all get to decide. And that's, you know, as it should be. But we start to vote if we don't vote for independence from the EU. Um, it is, it is losing us our sovereignty because they're unelected bureaucrats. Just really bureaucrats. quickly on that one. See, see, on this unelected point, do, do I wish the European Union was more democratic? Yes. Do I think it could be a lot more democratic? Yes. But this idea that the European Union is totally unelected and unaccountable, I just don't think is, is the case. It's got two lawmaking bodies, the European Union. One is the Council of Ministers, which is made up of ministers uh, of democratically elected governments. And the other one is the European Parliament, which is... Elected. Now, contrast that with the situation in the UK, where every law that comes out of Westminster is influenced by 900 unelected people 
in the House of Lords. I think if there's a real problem with unelected people governing, is it's the House of Lords rather than the European Union. Okay, on that one. Over to we'll just leave it at that. Okay, okay. Let's, let's the next, the next question. Um, next, next question from. Sorry, can we just Sorry. go to the next question Sorry. from Grace Jeremy? Hey, so Scotland seemed to be taking youth mental health refreshingly seriously, pledging an extra £150 million in mental health spending over the next five years and seeing 84.2% of youth referrals within your access time targets. If, it, if we stay in the EU, which I hope we do, what lessons do you think England could learn to reverse the current shambolic state of child and adolescent mental health services that have been brought on in recent years by Tory austerity measures? Well, I, I think stop austerity. And that, that's a great question. And actually, the answer to that question, I don't think, is really affected. There's nothing the European Union does that stops any of us as domestic governments investing more in our national health service or in mental health services. You know, obviously, immigration has been one of the big issues in this referendum campaign. Um, and yes, immigration causes pressures in some parts of the country. But if there's pressures on our public services, then the answer is to invest in our public services. And that's true of our NHS and housing. Um, and you know, mental health services is a good example of an area that needs investment. And it needs investment for actually quite a positive reason. Mental health no longer has the stigma that it once had. So people feel more able to come forward for help and treatment. And governments uh, have a responsibility to make sure we're providing the services that meet that need. So I think it's a great question about a really important issue. Can, can it be galling then to campaign on the same side as the Tories when you disagree on so much? I, I'm campaigning uh, on the, the, the basis that I think it's right to stay in the EU. I, I don't imagine that all of my reasons for wanting to stay in the EU are the same as David Cameron's reasons. Um, for example, one of the things I think we should stay in the EU to protect our workers' rights. Um, I think if David Cameron got his hands on all of these powers if we were out of the European Union, then he would try to get rid of a lot of the workers' rights and the, the social rights that are enshrined in uh, European law, you know, like paid maternity leave, equal pay, uh, pension protection. These are important things that are guaranteed across the European Union that I think are a good reason to stay in. Jim, next question. Yeah, we've got a question from Danny Ariani. Is it Danny there? There we go. If we leave, what will happen to the um, uh, farming industry? What will come off the single... Um, payment and how will the government support farmers? Well, th this is one of the things that I think the Leave campaign have, have been really contradictory around. You know, our, our farming industry, and this is very important for Scotland because uh, our, our farmers, as is the case in England, but get a lot of money from the European Union uh, through the Common Agricultural Policy. Now, the, Euro uh, the Leave campaign, you know, they've got this £350 million a week thing emblazoned across their bus. Uh, what they're saying is all the money we pay into uh, the European Union, uh, which is not 350 million a week, incidentally, but if we, if we don't have to pay into the European Union, we could give it to the health service. But some of the money that we pay into the European Union goes to our farmers, for example. So uh, presumably, if we were out of the European Union, you'd have to provide that money in a different way because supporting our farmers is really important and you know we've got challenges in Scotland just now in terms of some of this uh, so uh, I don't want to dismiss that but it's really important that our farmers have that support and that, it's just one of the many contradictions that appears to be at the heart of what the Leave campaign are saying. Okay we're going to go over to Remy and see what's going on. on yeah uh, Ben Crowden is back uh, he says <laughs> why do you want to abolish the unelected House of Lords um, but not the EU? Uh, are you only in favour of democracy when it suits you? I know I'm in favour of democracy all... Hello, Ben, by the way, he, he seems to be. Um, I, I'm in favour of democracy all the time. I, you know, I, I'm a politician. I, I live uh, by democracy and, you know, hope, hopefully I won't uh, do the other by democracy at some point. But we're all, you know, we're all governed by democracy. Why do I want to abolish the unelected House of Lords? The clue is in the phrase, it's unelected. And I don't think we should have uh, part of the Parliament uh, making the laws that affect us unelected. And that's just a, a basic principle. But, but, I, I appreciate so that may not be the most uh, uplifting prospect, but, but you can chuck us out if you don't like us, and that's the difference. Okay. okay, should we go to the next yeah. question? Sorry, Emily. Just one more question Sorry. here from Peter Wisher, student from Guildford. Hi, Peter. In the event of a leave vote, can Scotland expect to pursue more devolution to the Scottish Parliament? 
I hope we get more devolution uh, regardless of what happens in the European referendum. Um, but it doesn't follow that because there is a Leave vote, we automatically get more powers in the Scottish Parliament. One of the things the Leave campaign has been saying is if, uh, we, if there's a vote to come out, we get more powers over our fishing industry. Uh, now, what they presumably mean by that is the powers to negotiate uh, fishing deals. Well, if, if, we, if there's a vote to Leave, as I hope there isn't, those powers of negotiation would lie with the UK government, not automatically with the Scottish government. But I, you know, I come back to this, the, the Leave campaign, and it's their right to do this. They want to focus very much on what we lose by being in the European Union. I think we should focus on what we gain by being in the European Union. It's not perfect. I totally understand that people have got lots of frustrations. Well, let's stay in and try to deal with some of these. But the things that it delivers from peace and trade to more jobs uh, and job opportunities to the freedom of, of travel. You know, again, going back to the immigration debate, it's dominated by, you know, stop freedom of movement to stop people coming here. But we benefit from the freedom of travel. We get to travel or live or work and study in any other part of the European Union. I think that's a really good thing because getting to know people across borders and boundaries is actually one of the things that helps to avoid conflict and war and keep the peace. I think we should stay part of that, not because it's perfect, not because we shouldn't try to improve it, but because it would be a mistake to turn our back on it. Peter, what do you make of the answer? Uh, I'd just like to pick up on the studying at the EU. Do you seriously think that we'll not be able to study in Europe outside the European Union? Because we'll still be, as I understand, we'll still be on the visa-free list to be able to travel freely for Europe. For, freely for Europe. Well, I think the only problem we'd have is probably living. If we need to work you, it, uh, you know more than I do, because I don't know that that is guaranteed, but it would be, you know, I don't think anybody is can deny that it would be less easy to, to travel freely if you're not in that free travel zone. Now, nobody, going back to the point, I'm not going to stand here and make the, the mistakes of politicians who do indulge in scare campaigns. I'm not going to stand here and tell you you won't be able to travel to France or Spain or study there. I'm just saying it probably won't be as easy. Um, and, you know, I think when we've got that kind of freedom of movement, why go back the way? Why not keep it and try to build on it? And if there are things that need fixed and improved, let's try and play our part in fixing them and improving them. Got a question from Melissa, just behind Peter there. Hi, um, just further to that, um, I'm a PhD researcher based in Durham, but we work closely with the University of Glasgow and with universities across Europe. Um, and I could confirm from the perspective of PhD funding and research funding that it is going to be a lot more difficult if we leave. Yeah. I was at Glasgow University on Friday last week, a week ago today, um, speaking to uh, student Erasmus students. Erasmus, of course, is the, the programme that allows students to study part of their degree in different European countries, but also talking to a lot of researchers and a lot of different specialties who are working on European funded projects. And not just, they're not just projects that are European funded, they're projects, and you've just illustrated this point, where Scottish Glasgow uh, researchers are collaborating with researchers across Europe, mm -hmm. um, coming together to try to find the answers to some of the biggest challenges that the, the world faces. Again, that's a good thing. Um, so, yeah, you know, I'm not standing here telling you everything is, is perfect. But for goodness sake, there's lots of really good things here. Let's not uh, turn our backs on that. Uh, and that's really why I'm saying vote remain. Okay, we've sorry, got one question. Well. Sorry, yeah. Alexander. Thank you. Nice. I'm sorry, Nicola. I just can't understand how you can stand here in front of us today and say that you don't support an unelected House of Lords, but you're totally willing to accept Jean-Claude Juncker as our unelected President of Europe. Mm -hmm and the European Commission who sit and make decisions on our behalf without being appointed by the people. How can oh, you I'm, be pro one thing and then be completely I'm, hypocritical look, and pro I, other? I, I, I started by saying I, I think the European Union should be more democratic. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it shouldn't. I'm simply pointing out what, what are actually some factual points that Jean-Claude Juncker, and I'm, I, I hold no brief for Jean-Claude Juncker, um, but the European Commission is it's effectively the civil service of the European Union. It doesn't make the laws. And I know sometimes it feels as if it does. I know lots of people say it does. But the bodies that make the laws are the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament. Uh, and they are not unelected. So, yes, I think the European Union should be more democratic. I simply just don't think it's accurate to say that all of the laws are made by completely unelected people because right. it's not true. But, but, round table of okay. industrialists is actually higher than the EC and effectively hands the laws down to the EC to write them up to get them voted for. So uh, basically I think you need to look at the European round table to I, I'm, then uh, substantiate your arguments. I, I'm, I, I'm all of the view that we should look at all sorts of things. I, I think we should be arguing for more democracy. 
in the European Union. I think we should be arguing for more subsidiarity. I think there are some areas that the European Union shouldn't involve itself in. I've got an example uh, as First Minister just now where we've uh, legislated in the Scottish Parliament to introduce a minimum price for alcohol to try to help us deal with alcohol misuse. Uh, we legislated, what, four years ago? We're still not able to introduce it because it's, it's been held up in the, the courts arguing over European law. I think as First Minister on a matter of Scottish public health, I should be able to, or the Scottish Parliament should be able to take that decision. So I've got frustrations about the European Union. Uh, but I don't think that justifies yes, not, walking out of it. You're not okay. the for leaving the United Kingdom is exactly the same point. The, the, Scotland and the UK is not the same as the UK in Europe. But it's all Europe. about democracy, if, surely, Nicola. If, if, well, everything's about democracy, and that's why we, we all have the chance to take this decision in a couple of weeks' time. You're not guaranteed. Are you, 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 you going to respect? Are you, you going to respect after what Lord Astor said last week? After who? Lord Astor, David Cameron's step, stepfather, or stepfather-in-law, said that if there's a vote to leave democratic vote to leave, the House of Commons will ignore it because the majority of MPs support Remain. And so they will do everything in their uh, power to stop the referendum being respected. No, I, I, I don't, I don't think do you guarantee that your group, and you've got 56, is it, MPs, will respect I, the leave yeah. vote if that's what the outcome is? I, I've said in response to here, I think, you know, referendums are the most democratic expression of the public will that you can have and the outcomes of them should be respected. I, what I'm saying is I'm not going into all of the kind of different what-ifs around uh, the, the, the different hypothetical scenarios because I hope we're not in any of these. I, I actually hope there's a solid, <laughs> overwhelming... OK, thank you very much. You've had, had I, 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 I've just said dem democratic referendums should be respected. Of course well, they should. So okay. Thank you very much. First Minister, thank you very much for taking so many questions, taking so much time to talk to the crowd here we've got today. And I've got one final one for you. When it comes to the Euros, will you be supporting England? <laughs> <laughs> I've just been with the First Minister of Wales, uh, who asked me the, the same question. Uh, England versus Wales next week. Will you be supporting Wales? Look, I, I hope all the home nations do really well. I hope one of them is the winner. And I'm just totally... I'll, I'll, be, I'll support... Is it Russia tomorrow night? Uh, you, you know better than me. England, England versus Russia tomorrow night. Good luck, England, in the <laughs> game tomorrow night. Um, right, well, before we get on to that... Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for answering the questions, but there is the one quick stage we've got to go through now. We're going to see how you did according to the crowd in the room, and our audience in the room all have voting pads, so we're going to ask them very quickly if your answers have made them happy or sad. So quickly, <laughs> audience, if you could vote now, and then we're going to go over to Remy as well. While they're doing that, let's have a look at what our Facebook reaction tracker has been saying. People have been voting online. And uh, during this podcast, uh, podcast, broadcast, uh, people have been reacting, oh, 29% angry and 71% love. So people are loving you, Nicola Sturgeon, what you've had to say. So that's it for the uh, online reaction. But Jim, what's the reaction in the room? Uh, well, in the room, it's a little bit more nuanced, but we've got 61% love and 36% uh, against, so, you know, <laughs> uh, there we go. That'd be a good referendum outcome as well. I'd be <laughs> very happy with that. So, Nicholas, are you happy with that result? Yeah, absolutely. And it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, I have really enjoyed talking to you. So that's all we have time for now. In 20 minutes' time, you'll have your chance to put your questions to the leader of the UK Independence Party, Nigel Farage, who's backing Brexit. <laughs> Don't forget, you can Come sign on. up for notifications on BuzzFeed UK's Facebook page. So we'll see you in 20 minutes. But for now, thank you so much to First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon.